I think I'm just impressed that they even did this. Sky Captain and the World of Tomorrow, released in 2004, directed by Kerry Conran. Production budget of $70 million, a domestic take of $37 million, an international take of $20 million for a worldwide of $57 million. Sadly, recording a loss of $12 million, not including marketing and all those other, you know, costs. Starring Jude Law, Gwyneth Paltrow, Giovanni Ribisi, Angelina Jolie, and a surprise appearance by Omid Dajalili. I really like this guy. Okay, so let's talk about characters. The characters in this are... I don't know. On one hand, they're kind of flat, like a very stoic stage play almost. Except, in this one, the whole film feels like a radio play brought to life. So in many, many ways, these characters, the characters in this film, are exactly what they need to be to fit everything about this movie. That doesn't make sense. It doesn't... Hang on. Let me think. Anyhow, you've got Sky Captain. He is your dashing, heroic, mercenary uh, fighter pilot who leads a private army that go flies around the world saving the day. Pretty good character. He does what he's meant to do on screen. He doesn't exactly hit you with overpowering charisma. But Jude Law does a pretty good job at displaying this very cocky, self-assured fighter pilot. Then you have the former love interest and ongoing emotional foil, Polly Perkins, ace reporter. She's chasing a story of some missing scientists, which of course leads into this massive worldwide adventure to stop robotic Armageddon? Yeah, kind of something like that? You'll see. One of the best actor characters in the movie, I'd say she gets the most out of what little she's given to work with. You got Dex, the tech wizard offsider, and Frankie, commander of the British Mobile Recon Station, which is pretty much a helicarrier. Remind you of anyone? Oh, and Omid's character turns up, does some stuff, and then leaves again. As for villains, interestingly enough, the villains are mainly these things and her. None of which have lines, none of which actually really do anything. The villain in this, there is a villain, there is a villain, but it's a name and it's a picture. And it's a concept. This is one of those adventure mystery movies where the main villain is never seen. It's just you're dealing with everything that the main villain does. Which brings us around to the score for characters. And look, I'm going to have to go ahead and give this a 2.5. It's funny because I can't really call any of them bad. But at the same time, they all feel like a lot of wasted opportunity. Story. Now, this is where it gets a lot more interesting. This is an action-adventure mystery, okay? And you know what? The mystery is actually quite mysterious. I mean, you kind of had a feeling they were heading off to a climax to fight someone or something. But the reasons and the purposes behind it couldn't put that together. It, it's actually fairly unexpected. The whole reason behind everything is, is unusual. As a viewer, you're in the dark. You're in the dark. You're exploring with them. You're discovering with them. But you're not... I don't really see how he could have guessed ahead. On one hand, yeah, that's the idea of a mystery. You're not meant to know what's going on. On the other hand, quite often it's fun as a viewer to put, the, put it together and piece it together yourself and try to guess ahead and see if you're right. So anyway, the story is, look, the world is under attack by giant robots who are stealing resources. Now, Dex the Engineer managed to trace the radio signals controlling them back to the Himalayas, just in time before he himself is kidnapped. Sky Captain discovers his clue and then goes on a trek to go and rescue him and try to stop whatever the robots are up to. Oh yeah, they also figure out the name of the villain behind all this. And the Sky Captain goes from just wanting to stop him and get his mate back, to specifically and repeatedly stating that he's there to kill him. I didn't see how the story jumped to that, but alright, there we have his motive. His motive is murder. That would have probably made more sense if he knew more about the Sky Captain, and whether or not he was truly a mercenary, or if he's just this Kind of like good-hearted adventurer. They keep flipping on that. The adventure takes them onto the Himalayas, into Shangri-La. There's some more adventuring, there's some explosions, and then they're back in their plane and they're flying off across the, the ocean. Big one. A lot of water. Running out of fuel and end up landing on the helicarrier. They enlist the help of Commander Frankie, locate the island where the bad guy Dr. Tottenkov, Totten, Totten, bad doctor, is based. So they make an assault on there and they start creeping around the island, get sneaky, get busted, get rescued by Dex, who's made a breakout with the other scientists, all of which happens off camera and they conveniently turn up to save them. They rush off, solve the mystery, realize they still have to go and save the Earth, all because 
Spoiler! The main bad guy had decided the Earth is on a downward spiral, never to recover, so he's created a modern day Ark spaceship thing, filled it full of animals and resources, and jets off. Sky Captain was happy just to let him leave, to be honest, until they figured out that part of the plan was then to incinerate Earth as he left by igniting the atmosphere. It gets super dramatic sci-fi at the end, I can tell you that. Anyway, there's the last minute attempt to spoil the evil plans, which succeeds. The world is saved, a whole bunch of miniature animals are saved, and the relationship between Sky Captain and Perkins seems to be on the mend. So as you can tell, it's a true adventure story with a very, well, traditional arc, told in a very untraditional manner, and really does lack a bad guy, other than the main henchwoman and all the robots. It's mainly dealing with everything else that he's set up. It's not that it doesn't work, I mean the story plays out fairly well, it's quite an interesting story to actually, you're quite keen to figure out what's going on along with the Sky Captain, because you don't know, you've got no idea where this is going, and even when you do get there you're like, well, alright, wasn't expecting that, honestly wasn't expecting that. I think I'll be giving story a 3.25, because whilst it is fairly tried and true, it makes some changes, it does some things in unexpected ways, you really do want to know how it ends, so that's a good thing. Look and feel. Okay, so, wow. Wow, this is a unique looking movie. This does some stuff that just, at first, it throws you out. You're like, what am I watching? What is this? And then you, you get in the groove. You get used to it a bit. I mean, the whole thing looks like, well, this. Whole movie. Whole movie is this weird sepia tone film effect thing. No, enough of that. And it works! It actually works. Once you get your head around it, once you figure out what's going on, it works. Now the style and design of this film is really quite gorgeous. I mean the giant robots and the ray guns and the flying flappy metal bird ships. The sleek ray punk design of the boss's base and a lot of his henchmen, a lot of his technology and all that sort of stuff. The look, the look of this is, is quite different and I really enjoyed the stylistic artistic approach to this movie. But tell you what, it needed it too. From what I can tell, 80 to 90% of this film is green screen. Almost everything you're looking at isn't real. There are times where it's painfully obvious that these actors are just standing on a green screen wondering exactly what they're meant to be looking at. Alright, how's this? It looks so fake that it's clearly meant to be fake the fit with the stylistic choices and appearance of the film. A lot of the framing and silhouette work, a lot of the camera angles and the lighting effects, it is all so very exactly chosen to look the way it does. And then at the same time, you've got that question in your mind, but, but does it look good? Does it work? And my answer to that is mostly yes-ish. I had to keep reminding myself that it's meant to look like this. I had to keep telling myself, no, 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 it's meant to look pretty fake. Yeah, yeah, it's not meant to look realistic. The giant robot really isn't meant to look seamless to the scene. Although, every now and then they do. Every now and then it's perfect. Probably because there's no humans moving around in the scene. Oh, actually, yeah, humans moving around. There's one thing that did bug me. Every now and then you can see some very obviously animated characters running around in the background. Again, you could call it stylistic choice. However, these are animated characters running around with real characters. And the difference is quite obvious. But you take that and then you take all the monsters and the dinosaurs and the giant beasties and just the crazy things that they keep finding and how they well they represent it and everything that's just very very interesting and very very clever about how they've done it and you get a very conflicted me because I want to mark it down for the fact that it looks so very fake at times I mean extremely fake at times but I want to mark it up quite high for the, just the artistic merit and vision that's been involved in producing something like this this is art I'd say it's going to even out at a three, which is a bit of an anticlimax after all this talk. That's the middle ground between the two extremes that I want to put this at. So, yeah, I think after all that, it's a three. Script and dialogue, right. Well, did I mention that this actually comes across as an old school radio play? Oh, yeah. Yeah, this is some incredible cheesy stuff going on here. It is also a homage to Superman, Batman, 
Indiana Jones, Star Wars, Isle of Dr. Moreau, King Kong, Flash Gordon, Buck Rogers, a whole bunch of Marvel stuff, Wizards of Oz, and I think The Matrix. Depends when The Matrix was released, I can't remember. It resembles or directly references all of those at some stage, and usually more than once. Is it a bad thing? Well, it would be except it turns into an Easter egg hunt. I had more fun identifying other movie references than the actual movie I was watching. But all the lines that come out of the characters' mouths and their actions and their motivations and everything like that is extremely cliche and extremely cheesy. But much like everything else I've described, all of it pretty much matches the movie it's presented in. Pacing and presentation, a little slow at some stages, some of the action sequences end up feeling like half a sequence. They feel like they're building up to something and they don't deliver, or it's resolved very, very quickly or very, very simply. I mean, there were almost countless scenarios where they're under threat, but I never felt like I was going to lose a character. There was, there was no chance of any of these people dying, and you knew it. It just didn't feel like that sort of movie. And I suppose there's the other danger of filming everything on green screen. The characters just don't react in the way you're expecting them to according to what's happening. The Star Wars prequels are another example of that. And it's been mentioned many times by world-class actors and directors that a green screen is very, very hard to work against because they just don't have anything to really play off, to work with. Doesn't stop it from being very cool to look at, but cool to look at doesn't always translate to a good time. This review's taking so long, my coffee's gone cold. Yeah. The so script and dialogue, look, I'll be giving it a 2.5 as well. It was in danger of dropping low, but the way that they presented it really does actually match the style of the movie. Like I said, it feels like a radio play on film. Fun factor. Okay, well, look, I, I had fun? Kind of? Mostly. I mostly had fun-ish. Okay, let's think about it. Am I going to watch this again? Maybe. More out of curiosity than anything, I think. Would I recommend this to others? Yes. But again, out of curiosity, as an example of just something different. But would you call it good different? I'd probably call it okay different. I wouldn't say it's a waste of time. Just not sure if everyone's going to enjoy it for the same reasons I mostly did. Can't really say much more without going over what I've already said, and I've already said a lot. So yeah, I'll be giving this one a 2.5 for fun factor. Quite the curious movie, if nothing else. Final score. Add these all up and you get a 13.25. Feels a little harsh for how much fun I had playing Spot the Movie reference, but at the same time, that isn't the basis for a good movie. I really quite admire it in many ways for just the artistic effort and the vision, the whole look and feel that they were going for. I'm actually quite impressed with that. So there you go. There's my review of Sky Captain and the World of Tomorrow. I really want to know if anyone else has seen this film. I'd love to hear some opinion on this. I'm expecting a divide. I'm expecting people who love it and a lot of people who just think it's a bit of a waste of their time. Anyhow, there you go. Thanks for watching. Hope you had a good time. Please like, share and subscribe. And as always, hope you're having a great week and you make some time to go and watch a movie.